Good afternoon, and welcome to Multiplier Factors' uh, you know, discussion about uh, case studies for distributions for publishers. Uh, we're going to be going through you know, what distributions are, and then uh, going into a specific case study uh, that may or may not be involved with some of the uh, swag that I'm wearing right now. And, uh, and then take questions as we go along. So uh, and actually, you can submit questions at that link. So uh, my name is John Peck. I'm an architect at Four Kitchens. I've been working at Four Kitchens for about two and a half years. I've been working in Drupal for several, um, yeah, several years. Uh, prior to Four Kitchens, I worked at uh, Pantheon Systems uh, as a senior customer success engineer. Uh, I've worked on uh, a number of very large sites, and uh, we've been focusing mostly on publishing sites, which is going to be the crux of this presentation. Uh, the things that I'm going to be talking about are, and what we're going to be talking about are applicable not only to publishing, but usually just to large websites in general. So uh, I'm joined today by... Courtney Eustis. Hello, everyone. I will be playing the role of John's sidekick for today's presentation. Uh, I am with Meredith Agri-Media. If you think of Meredith, you might think of Better Homes and Gardens, All Recipes, Parents, Fitness, Shape. I work on some of the digital strategy for some of the like, tier two, tier three sites, agriculture.com, woodmagazine.com. I'll give two we're going to be covering today. Been with Meredith five years, and uh, I'm not a very technical person, so a lot of the stuff is, is really on John's plate, but um, I, I can certainly add some color to why we went with this strategy. So, uh, so there's a question that we just need to answer right up front, which is what is a distribution? Uh, you know, this isn't just a word that's just being thrown around, there's actual semantic meaning in it. So a Drupal distribution, officially according to the Drupal.org uh, documentation, is a full copy of core with additional software. And, uh, you know, with that said, it's basically, it's a framework of dependencies and custom code that will make up a Drupal site. Uh, the idea of a you know, distribution is that it's a, you know, a turnkey operation. It contains everything that is needed to have a you know, Drupal site up and running. Uh, Drupal.org hosts a number of uh, custom distributions uh, that are you know, purpose-built. Sometimes they are you know, intended for a particular use case. Sometimes, uh, you know, for example, COD, for example, is uh, intended for uh, setting up conferences. Uh, there are also uh, developer toolkits that are just intended to have like all you know a selection of common tools that will make it easy to get up and running and to build a custom site. There's a number of different variations. Uh, so installation profiles are related to but are not the same as a distribution. A installation profile actually just configures Drupal and is used primarily in that first step, the installation step, uh, you know, that wizard that you go through with your UI that asks you questions about you know, what username uh, you'd like to use. Uh, in, a, in a distribution, it can ask you more questions about like, how to configure it. Uh, the installation profile will also configure Drupal in a particular way, enabling modules, uh, you know, configuring the theme in a particular way. Uh, and uh, you know, provides the installation and the configuration steps. You know, a distribution itself actually contains all the software that is needed for Drupal, including Drupal itself and uh, including you know, third-party uh, configuration and an installation profile. It can even just be the standard profile, but typically a distribution will contain a custom installation profile that will configure the site in a particular way. Um, so there's uh, more details about distributions available on Drupal.org. Uh, I'm going to be pre uh, posting the slides afterwards. Don't worry about actually typing down that URL. So uh, a question that I'm going to head off, you know, pretty fast is uh, you know why not multi-site? Multi-site is a technique of uh, creating a single uh, Drupal site code base that uh, hosts multiple Drupal instances. Uh, through a combination of uh, configuration and data database management. Um, it's not a great technique. Uh, it's typically very fragile. It doesn't scale well. Uh, fragile in that it, uh, maintainability is very difficult because you get into a situation where you can have uh, changes for, that will work on one site but not work on another, especially if you're working on, uh, if you're working on a shared component. Uh, you can usually mitigate that with uh, you know, a smaller uh, instance where you have, say, maybe like one or two sites, or two or three sites running at the same time, but then try to scale that up. Okay, I have uh, a change 
that uh, on a multi-site that has 50 instances, 49 of them, it works fine. That one prevents everybody else from upgrading and so that you know, problem is solved. Also, uh, it's difficult to maintain those uh, it's, uh, in that uh, testing changes across every single site uh, and then making sure everybody's in lockstep. So, because you can have a change that works for everybody, looks fine, you deploy it, and then it turns out like you know, somewhere buried in one of these uh, you know, 49 sites is one site that doesn't work correctly with an up upgrade. And so having everything in lockstep like that doesn't work well. So uh, I'm not the, uh, it's also a candidate for uh, deprecation in uh, Drupal 8 and complete removal in Drupal 9. This, this does not mean this is happening yet, but it is a candidate for discussing it and discussing it very strongly. So uh, there is a Drupal.org issue. Uh, you feel, uh, feel free to weigh in with your opinion. Uh, there's also a blog post that I will refer to uh, that was written by Josh Koenig of uh, Pantheon Systems. Uh, actually about three years ago, but uh, all the logic uh, and uh, semantic reasoning behind it still applies. So it's called Much Ado About Drupal Multisite. So uh, there are three different kinds of distributions. I'm going to use slightly different terminology than what's used on uh, Drupal.org, uh, but it, I feel that it applies to these particular use cases. So there's monolithic distributions, there are uh, atomic distributions, and then a hybrid that is kind of you know, best of both worlds. So monolithic distributions. So uh, all the code in the same repository. This is what you're gonna find on Drupal.org if you want to download COD, for example. It's gonna have everything all in the same place, including like the complete copy of all the uh, contrib modules, uh, any third-party module uh, code, like uh, if you have a particular jQuery component, for example. Uh, so there are a number of advantages for this. I mean, it's easy to distribute you know, a package, a zip file or a tar or what have you, that contains everything. It's like, oh, here it is. You have everything that you could possibly need, and you don't, no additional steps are necessary to get anything. Everything is literally in the same place. However, uh, it's really, it's basically impossible to code review uh, changes you know, to this type of approach. Uh, because uh, you have a conflation of you know, contrib code uh, and custom code. So I, if, for example, maybe I wanted to add views and then I uh, add a, you know, maybe I featureize the view in, uh, on top of that. So if I'm trying to do a diff and on, the, uh, on that change, I see all of, you know, every single line of code that exists within views and also my custom changes. That's not practical, uh, especially if you're like trying to make sure that like the only changes that take place are good and valid. Uh, it makes it impossible to code or do. Uh, it's also magnificently bloated because it's just very large on disk. It's uh, difficult to work, you know, to work with. Uh, again, like you have like this conflation of like the contrib and your custom code. Uh, the history is uh, history is a mess, especially uh, because you. Uh, you can easily, like, uh, if you have a contrib module such as use, for example, it has its own uh, history. All of that is completely erased. Now you have created your own version of it that exists within your repository. Uh, you're also mirroring repositories. You're doing extra work. This goes back to the bloat because Drupal.org exists. It has the repositories that host all these projects. Why are you creating yet another copy of it? And uh, patching becomes really, uh, it's, a, it, it's a nightmare because you don't necessarily have, it, it, unless you have like a really careful strategy of like this is the only way that you can apply a patch and here's the patch itself and here's a particular version of the patch uh, of software that this patch is not applying against, you have no idea that you know, software contains a change. So maybe I download views but I don't agree with one particular line and I can change it and commit that. For all intents and purposes, based on the version number I'm running on 7.3.1, but actually 7.3.1 plus this code change, you have no way of knowing that based on the history. So it's a mess. It's not recommended uh, to use this for active development. Uh, so a solution to this is what's known as the build process. Uh, software build process. And a build process converts source files into standalone artifacts. Uh, a standalone artifact contains everything that's needed to run. So the result of a build process is basically that monolithic distribution, everything that comes with it. 
And actually, distributions on Google.org are typically built with a Drush make file, uh, which contains you know, basically one of these, uh, it's a source file that says, these are the custom things that need to come in, into this project to be able to make this standalone thing that you can now use as a turnkey. So uh, monolithic distributions are artifacts. So steps in the build process, uh, it's downloading packages and applying patches. You know, you might make a modification. I like this particular version, but maybe I don't agree with this particular functionality, so I'm going to make a change to it. Uh, Drush make for Drupal 7 and below is you know, a perfectly acceptable uh, system for doing that. Uh, Composer for Drupal 8 and above uh, is a, you know, will handle both the downloading and the uh, application of patches as well. Uh, you know, JavaScript will also, uh, you know, has a system, NPM will do that. Uh, and then uh, compiling assets. So if you have front-end assets, especially, especially like you know, SCSS, CSS, JavaScript minification, image you know, minification, you're making these kind of like changes. So you have a source repository that has all the raw pieces together of your site, and then part of the build process will make that conversion. And then it'll pay, you know, package for deployment, and so sometimes it's adding Adding those results to a Git repository, sometimes it's zip it up and send it off. Um, you know, if you're using an ant-based workflow, for example, uh, you add it to source control or you copy or archive it. So there's a number of different build systems that can be used that are off the shelf. I mean, you can also just you know manually script it, but usually it's better to leverage existing work. So Aquifer is a system that uh, was built in-house at Four Kitchens, but is now maintained by like people both within and outside of Four Kitchens. Uh, available on GitHub. Uh, it's written in Node.js. Uh, Acquia Bolt, or BLT, Bacon, Lettuce, Tomato. Uh, it's available at uh, acquia.com slash BLT. Uh, it takes a different approach, uses Bing uh, uh, on the back end, along with uh, you know, a series of scripts. Uh, Grunt Drupal Tasks is exactly that. It's a Grunt-based system uh, maintained by Phase 2. Uh, there's more than one way to solve this particular problem each each one of these tools has a uh, you know, diff different level, uh, different approaches to kind of like the same kind of problem. Um, and e each of them has their advantages and disadvantages. I would say if you're, if you're evaluating build systems, take a look at all three of them and also just you know, make, use the best tool that works for your organization and use case. So with that context, you know, what, what, this, what is a build system? Let's look at atomic distributions. This is going kind of to the other extreme, where you know, first extreme, monolithic, everything's all in the same place. Atomic distributions uh, is, you know, uses a build process to get components. Sounds great. Every custom module is in, a, in its own repository. Huh. That's, you know, that now everything's kind of all spread out. Oh, it's very neat. You have one, you know, have a one-to-one -one ratio between a custom, you know, custom module or and a Git repository. You've got a very clean history. You know exactly what's there. There's a readme right, right at the top of the directory. So it's really, you know, you have an explicit separation of history. You know exactly what changes have taken place. Uh, it's great for versioning. You know exactly how uh, this particular module is, uh, you know, a repository. Maybe it's pinned to a particular commit ID. Maybe it's pinned to a, you know, a version, what have you. Uh, disadvantage is you can have dozens or hundreds of repositories. I bring this up not as a, uh, uh, as a esoteric example, this is a real world example used by another publishing company, and this is what they did. And uh, you know, the pull re uh, pull request that will actually modify modify these are dependency nightmare. So to make one change, you know, to uh, affect the functionality, you actually need to submit like four or five different pull requests to all these different repositories just like to make changes. It's just it's dreadful. Now, uh, maintaining a you know build process, you know this is um, you know, it's like it takes work to configure those tools and make sure that you know things are up to date. And uh, and also by having uh, you know all these separate Git repositories, it just literally takes more time because each one of those is connection is doing it. You know, uh, the SSH is down. You know, it's downloading repositories, it's doing uh, you know comparisons. These things take time. So instead try a hybrid approach where you can kind of take the best of both worlds, having uh, all of the custom code in one place, and, but having uh, you know, contrib code still not part of your repository. So uh, you still have a build process to get the individual components, but the custom code is in the distribution repository. So by doing this, you do still have the centralized code. Everything is one place. So you're gonna, uh, you submit a pull request against 
that one repository, not five or six or 10 or what have you, just the, the single one. It's easier to work with, you have faster build because everything is in the same, uh, same place. The, you know, the third party components are still retrieved, but you, you only have the reference to what they are, what versions they are, you, you're not actually, uh, and if you're using a, a system like Composer, for example, actually both Composer and Drushnate will cache locally and say, okay, well, I, last time I wanted to use 7.1, I, I have this particular copy of it, I'm gonna use that rather than downloading it each time. Uh, so uh, it's not perfect. I mean, there's still many dependencies. You can you know, run into a situation where it's like, hey, I need this thing. Oh, GitHub's down. Oh, well, that's not working. Okay, well, I guess we're just gonna wait for that to happen. Uh, or Drupal.org you know, has stability problems sometimes because you know, we're, you know, things happen. Still needs a build process. I mean, it still requires like, you know, uh, an additional step. Um, so it's, you know, it's not perfect, but it does address many of the problems and keeps the code repository really clean and makes it easier to work with. So uh, with all this con uh, context, it's like, what is a distribution? What is a build system? Let's talk through, uh, you know, actually a practical application of how we use this uh, at Node Dev Media. Yeah, uh, so now we can finally talk about things that I understand, uh, which is the scope of the project, uh, and then let, let John and the Four Kitchens team really figure out how, um, how we make it happen. John's a builder, I'm just gonna put it all up there. Uh, for agriculture.com, which is one of the sites under Meredith Agri-Media, um, we know that we needed a new site, right? Uh, <laughs> um, we were on a, a CMS that was six years old, it was built, and then rebuilt and rebuilt and rebuilt. And it was kind of a nightmare and we had a lot of content in there that we couldn't access. Um, so Ag gets roughly 1.3 million pages a month, 500,000 or 450,000 sessions. Um, very, very niche audience. Also a very profitable site for, for our team. When we looked at Wood, um, we realized that they probably needed a site, um, mainly because their editors couldn't even access the CMS, um, which is a problem in a, in a publishing world. True story. <laughs> um, oh, thanks. Um, they're, they're focused more on downloadable plans, um, woodworking plans, and um, also a very niche audience. Um, they get roughly 2 million page views and 550,000 sessions a month. Um, so not huge, but, but very profitable. And while Ag is more of a B2B model, um, focused more on the slightly broken, um, breaking more every day display advertising model. The wood team is more focused on reader revenue. So we had all of those things that we were kind of trying to, um, to piece together when we thought about this. And um, thankfully, our teams worked very closely together and there were a lot of commonalities from the start when we looked at what are we trying to, uh, what are we trying to achieve with this, with the launch of the two new sites. Um, the, in the publishing world, in the media world, if we don't have an audience, um, well, let's start by, if we don't have content, um, we don't have an audience. If we don't have the right audience, we really have nothing to market to sell. So it's incredibly important that our editors can get into the CMS and get in there quickly, efficiently, get content out where it needs to be. Um, so that, that we realized that first and foremost, we needed to focus on that. Um, I also, you know, ad blockers keep me up at night. Um, I told you on, on agriculture.com, most of our revenue is coming from the display world. Um, so we needed to address a couple of things. One, try to find um, a platform that would simplify testing for us. So if we want to test paywall, gated content, um, different kinds of reg things, we could do that with Drupal. Um, and we could do it for Wood and for Ike kind of seamlessly. We also um, fully recognize that maybe we catered a little bit too much on the advertising side and needed to return a focus on the user experience. Um, and, and all of these things could be leveraged across both sites, right? We both need an audience. We don't, we don't just need page views, we need an audience that's engaged on the site, coming back multiple times, staying on there. You know, we, we look at time-based models as opposed to really the traditional impression-based models, so the engagement metrics are very, very critical to, to the scope of this project. Um, Agriculture.com and Successful Farming has been around, uh, well, Successful Farming, has been around for 104 years and Wood has been around for roughly 35 years. So we needed, when we launched, just to maintain the loyalty that we had with our audiences. On the technical side, I'm really taking all the fun out of this, um, but all the content types, the kind of stuff that we're putting in there, it's just, you know, articles, uh, images, slideshows, taxonomies, all that stuff was very similar for both brands. 
Um, the way that we get content in, into the site and get it distributed is also similar across both brands, um, especially when we finally gave the wood team access to a CMS. It was a very, very exciting day. Uh, we are. <laughs> We are part of, of Meredith Corporation, so there are lots of things that we had to have on the site that needed to be on, on both wood and ag. Uh, Karma is our, our ad serving system. We had Lithium for the forums and community. We've got Single Sign-On, Google Analytics, Ramp is, a, is our OVP, Gigio for commenting and social sharing. So all those things need to be on both sites. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the platform stuff, John, you read it up there. I don't really know what I'm talking about there. Okay. Um, so, even though there are a lot of commonalities, we know that there were, um, were going to be a couple of challenges that we were able to identify pretty quickly in the process. Um, Ag um, has a, typically um, been more profitable and therefore had a bigger budget for the project. Um, so we needed to figure out what we could, if, if we're going to use this multiplier effect, right, what can we do on Ag that can just be implemented on wood immediately because we're not paying for any of that um, and really save the, the big differences um, for, for the wood budget. Um, Meredith has um, many sites that are on Google now, but the way we're structured is, is a little bit siloed in terms of how those sites are developed. So there's some partial adoption um, across, you know, institutionally, but not really any standards that we could hand over to four kitchens and say, here's exactly what we need you to do for all of these pieces. Um, we, the way that AgriMedia is structured, we didn't have necessarily one single owner of the project. Um, we have site owners, really, uh, but we didn't have someone looking globally or holistically from start to finish at the project. Um, so Four Kitchens, um, we had to work with them to help them understand how, how, um, how that works. We also, um, Four Kitchens had to deal with kind of Meredith um, IT procedures and policies, which may or may not have made sense to their traditional way of doing work. Um, you know, everyone operates a little bit independently. So working through that and making sure without any institutionalized standardization of, of a Drupal um, site, what needed to happen there um, to be able to compromise. Third piece is just different third-party integration. On Ag, we need commodity data, we need weather, um, uh, Wood Magazine doesn't need that. They need more than e-commerce um, integration and, and things in that nature. So recognizing that right off the bat and what those differences would be was, was very important. Back to John. Okay, so that kind of a gnarly uh, diagram here, but this is actually, uh, this is the code flow and how a distribution uh, kind of works with, you know, in regards to like individual repositories. So uh, you're kind of starting up at the top uh, we have this uh, uh, parent distribution. Uh, ag, 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 so this is the parent. This is what everything you know goes into. All the content on the top. We actually see something up here on top. Parents.com Drupal. So uh, this is another uh, you know Meredith property. It's a Drupal site. Um, there's a, in, 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 in itself is actually a fork of yet another uh, you know different multi site that uh, that the advantage of like working. And you see this as a partial base site. They had a couple modules uh, that handled you know, specific use cases, specifically uh, uh, integration of single sign-on um, and uh, registration and subscription management. These were pieces that already existed. We wanted to leverage, uh, you know, existing build, not move them to wheel because you know, that's that's inefficient. We wanted to try to, like, you know, establish a, a process that if changes were made upstream would be working. So we have. Uh, as part of uh, uh, yeah, as part of our build process, where the distribution actually brings in uh, code from parents.com, you know, select basically only gets a couple modules that are brand agnostic, and uh, passes a couple of them to you know make sure that they uh, adhere to our use case. So you have the distribution itself. Then you have a fork, uh, you know, and two uh, two forks: one for agriculture.com and one for Wood Magazine. Uh, each one of these forks is, you know, starts off as a perfect copy uh, of the ad distribution. But from here, we can make changes. We can add custom code. We can add a functionality that's specific to the brand. So you have to look in the field, you know, for uh, you know, uh, successful farm. There was added bar charts uh, integration for what that is in. There was uh, integrating with the wood store uh, and the e-commerce platform. Uh, but each of them, after that, has a, a build process, uh, and it's basically the same build process using. Uh, using the script 
that uh, you know, uh, use Opera in our particular case to actually create the artifact that is then deployed to the site. So, um, and the advantage of doing this is any changes made in that distro can be pulled in an asynchronous state in each one of these. So, um, you know, for example, uh, you know, if there's a uh, the version of Drupal, it, you know, there's a security copy. Uh, we had time to uh, test it on one, but not the other, for, you know, for whatever reason, we deployed it to agriculture.com, but not to the wood magazine, or vice versa. And then, you know, so these could theoretically be on, you know, different, uh, different versions of Drupal or a particular module, um, but, you know, at the end of the day, these changes are going to be common in any particular time. And the build process is agnostic. It doesn't really care, uh, you know, what version it's using, it's just using the script. So, uh, as part of this, uh, and th this is part of the scalability aspect of it, having a uh, robust text and testing mechanism. So every code change uh, you know, that is made to an active show and also to each, uh, each, of the, uh, uh, each of the children is automatically checked uh, you know, using, uh, using software uh, and specific tools, you know, checking for syntax errors using, ironically, a JavaScript uh, a system called PHP Lint that uh, uh, does a parallel, uh, you know, lint uh, for of every single PHP file in the repository. Uh, also, checking uh, against coding standards using PHP Code Sniffer along with uh, the Drupal Sniffs, the, the rule set for Drupal coding standards uh, maintained in the Coder module, and also ES Lint, which uh, using the uh, using the standards from uh, Drupal eight, which as of I think Drupal seven point five zero are now actually in Drupal four now. As well, so we can probably remove that. Uh, functional testing, uh, we used uh, B hat uh, along with Mink and the B hat Drupal extension, so we could actually you know, define functional testing steps for you know that would apply to every single uh, site, and then uh, you know each one of the children had like a couple extra steps you know for, to functional functionally test things that only existed on that particular site. So by by using by uh, by using automated testing and verifying that every single code change is automatically checked, uh, we prevented a whole bunch of regression errors. We uh, prevented uh, you know kind of situations where uh, I mentioned going back to like multi-site approaches where uh, you can have a code change that might have an unintended effect on one site. So we actually uh, by uh, providing a mechanism that actually does automated testing, uh, you could be uh, it's not a guarantee, but you can be reasonably certain that this code change is not going to have a negative effect on the site experience. So, uh, local development, um, you know, as uh, uh, as any developer can probably tell you, their choice of tooling may be slightly different. Some people use Windows, some people use Linux, some people may use Mac OS, some people use a calculator, what what have you. Um, we wanted to have a standardized approach that would work for everyone and be relatively platform agnostic. And we wanted to focus on actually developing a product. So we decided to standardize on Drupal VM. And across uh, four kitchens at this point, I think it's pretty universal that we're using Drupal VM as a standard local uh, development environment. Uh, it's, uh, it was not actually explicitly required uh, you know, for our developers working on this project. With that said, uh, it was the only supported path. If you want, if you want to do things using uh, native packages, yeah, that's fine, but we're not going to help you troubleshoot because this, there's one path that you know that we know we can guarantee that will work. Um, and uh, at the time of development, we actually had it down to one configuration step where you actually had to just say this is the path to the you know code on disk. Uh, actually, since this project launched, I uh, uh, came up with a way that requires absolutely no configuration. Uh, if you just basically run Composer. Uh, Composer install, it will uh, install all the dependencies and configure it locally and uh, you know, keep it in sync. So, um, and also uh, you know, mentioning uh, Meredith IT, they, uh, they leverage some of the existing uh, playbooks that are used to configure Drupal VM in, in order to create their own uh, hosting configuration for their environments. Uh, the advantage of this is you have a local development environment that was in relative functional parity with the uh, production environment, because the last thing we want to hear is the excuse of like, it worked on my local, but it doesn't work in production. So uh, we also used uh, editor config files, uh, which is a file format and text editor plugin for maintaining coding standards. Uh, you know, it's just, it, it's not that deep and complex. It will just uh, say, it's like, okay, for this particular project, we're gonna enforce 
you know, spaces instead of tabs, or you know, two spaces instead of four spaces. It's just that, you know, just little kind of silly things like that that are common, but if everybody's configured in the same, uh, in line engine, for example, uh, if everybody has their uh, development environments configured in the same way, then you don't get into um, big messy commits or just you know, arguments about coding standards or problems with uh, uh, algorithmic checkers that say correctly that this, is, this wasn't done correctly. Uh, so you know, with that, uh, we used Aquifer as the build system, uh, you know, composer for uh, the PHP package manager uh, on top of uh, you know, Drush Make, um, and uh, you used it to get some of the external dependencies. Uh, NPM, which I mentioned, uh, Gulp is a task runner in the front end build system. Uh, we used Circle CI uh, for a you know, continuous integration tool. Uh, did not use it for artifact generation uh, because of uh, some of the IT requirements. Instead, used uh, Jenkins for both uh, the client hosted builds, uh, artifacts creation, and uh, deployment. So, uh, the you know, I'm going to go through the directory layout. Uh, there's a lot of information I'll try to go through here, through it quickly, and also just try to focus on the important things. So slash build actually is the working directory. This is what the actual artifact is built into. This is uh, this is ignored in uh, in Git, so it's not actually committed. Uh, Circle CI contains the Circle CI specific configuration. Slash docs contains markdown files uh, and basically all the technical project documentation. Uh, and we recommend this as best, uh, you know, best practices approach because you have the technical documentation that actually ships with the product itself. You don't have to go looking for it in a wiki or Google Docs or wherever the heck you may have it. Uh, you know, it's like if Meredith decided that they wanted to maintain the site or make a copy of it and start uh, you know, implementing their own site, they have all the documentation in one place. They don't have to hunt for it. Uh, dr slash Drush contains the Drush aliases and a Drush RC for you know for the project slash files is uh, the site files that are reserved between builds so you can actually you know you can blow away all the uh, blow away all the code but um, you know say if you're using a, um, right if you're using database snapshots that have references to particular files those files will continue to persist between builds. Uh, gulp tasks contains exactly what that sounds like. Uh, slash modules is uh, the custom modules for the project. Slash patches is pretty self-explanatory. Post provision is the Drupal VM uh, custom steps that we have. You know things like uh, configuring uh, Apache Solar, for example, uh, or installing a particular version of uh, you know Google Chrome that was more performant than the one that Drupal VM shipped with at the time. Um, so, you know, slash profiles uh, contains the custom installation profile. Uh, for this project, we only had one available that would just configure just base modules and uh, um, you know making sure that things like PHP filter aren't turned on. Uh, slash provisioning uh, contains Drupal VM, uh, and this was at the time. This is the way that we did it. Now, Drupal VM can be installed via Composer, and I would actually recommend doing that instead. Um, Slash root is uh, contains the contents of your root folder, so it just contains a custom HD access. Uh, if you have like site verification files and so forth, you can throw it in there. Uh, scripts are bash utilities that were used uh, that uh, you know basically shortcuts or things that we use on a regular basis. Uh, there was a script in there, for example, that would run the bhat tests uh, locally. Uh, slash settings contains just uh, you know all the custom uh, you know custom local settings.php. Uh, you know, tests contain the B hat tests. Um, you know, slash themes contains the theme. So the result of all of this, actually, I'll let you go through this. Yeah, back up. All right. <laughs> um, again, we led with uh, we led with iPulse.com. It was a bigger, heavier site with a lot more pieces of content to migrate. And that that entire process, working through all the IT stuff. Took about six months. Um, so then we came to Wood. We already had all the objectives established. We knew what we needed there. Uh, that took really about five weeks. Um, and so this was a proof of concept for our group. I think we're looking at trying to, to replicate this for some other brands and continue this this effect. Um, what, what we've seen uh, is that on, on the maintenance side, um, costs have already been reduced, right? Because we're really kind of maintaining one thing and, and applying that. And then there are a couple of outliers outliers here and there that need to be addressed. But um, maintenance in general has um, become much easier and much more cost effective, which is very important to our business today. Um, we found that it, you know we can identify problems. So every site has its owner. 
um, and different people working in it, but the teams work really closely together. So if something's wrong on one site, it's typically wrong on the other site. We can find it quickly. We can address it before anyone else finds out and no one gets in trouble. And it's, uh, and it's all wonderful. Users are protected. So lot, lots of good things um, post-launch. With um, client feedback would be our editorial team, um, our sales organization, anyone that touches the site and verifies the media. I think that the training the trainer method that 4K implemented with us um, has been very positive. We are a small team, limited resources, both uh, human and financial. So anytime we can leverage capabilities across the board, we try to do that. Um, that's what train the trainer has, has has let us do, um, and just that Drupal is so much easier to use and the, the proprietary stuff are going to go that we were on before. Um, I talked before about the critical need for us to get content out and get it out quickly and um, effectively. So we were able to remove a lot of bottlenecks. For wood, I think five people had to touch one piece of content before it was on the site before. Uh, now, thankfully, it's just one. Um, so they can pick it out very quickly. Uh, on Ag, all of our editors now have access um, to the CMS, same as Wood, so they're pushing stuff out directly and no more bottlenecks. We, both sites, um, while Ag is really a, a new site, there's still a ton of evergreen content on there. I mean, we get 25,000 people to worry about it right now. Um, Wood, all the project plans, all of the reviews, all of that stuff, it was really getting buried because of the, the silent structure that we had on both sites, um, both in terms of the content type and um, the organization of that content. So with this, we are able to um, to look across the board at both sites and understand um, and, and figure out ways to resurface that content and repurpose it and take a little bit of the pressure off our editors. Because we have six editors and such a small team, it's really important for us to, to find other ways to keep the site fresh. Right? We don't have editors working on the clock 24 hours pushing news out. Um, so what can we automate in that process and do it across the board, whether it be um, a tip of the day, um, pulling in from the forums module and, and making sure that stuff is surfaced and just the related content stuff. Um, so all those things had to happen and were needed on both sites. What we find is that people don't, um, users don't come to the site looking for a particular content type. They're, they're looking for a subject. So they come to our they're looking for commodities prices. They come to wood looking for a, a project plan. They don't come looking for a video. They don't come looking for an article. They don't come looking for a slideshow. So, this move to Drupal has allowed us to be a lot more uh, content agnostic um, to to um, to uh, effectively you know enhance that user experience and make sure that no matter where they're coming from, they find what they need quickly and they can find more of it and stay on the site. I I also have to liaise with the, the sales side and kind of define a sales strategy, and we were having a lot of problems on both sides with discrepancies between. Um, between our ad server and, and third party ad servers, up to 40%. You know, they say we delivered X, um, we said we delivered 40% more than that. So we have very small audiences to begin with, and when you start wasting 40% of that audience on the ad side, it becomes a real problem. Um, so we started with page load times, sped those up uh, quite a bit, and then worked on some other fundamentals. So this discrepancy is well under 10% now across the board. It's really important for our, for our groups. Uh, the specific numbers, I, I think numbers always tell a good story. Our, I talked about the ad serving discrepancies, and I think it starts with viewability. If something's not seen, it's really hard to, to track any other metric beyond that. So our site-wide viewability went from 42% to 93%. So we went from wasting 60% of, of the site traffic to wasting 8% of the site traffic. Um, so really, really strong numbers. We decreased the page load time 67%. So if viewability is the foundation for the ad side, I think probably page load times are the foundation on, on the site side itself. And, but um, when you think about um, for, for ag, a farmer being out in the field, being on mobile, you cannot afford to have a page that's taking a long time to load. Um, so working with four kitchens to, to strip out anything you don't really need um, and to just make sure everything um, is a positive experience. I talked about evergreen brands as well, or the evergreen content needing to resurface that. What we've seen is that we are able to increase exposure to that to that content that was before very underutilized, just kind of sitting under there, never being discovered. Um, about 44% um, increased exposure to that. And there's a stat that I think is really amazing. I haven't I haven't tested it on Wood because their site wasn't as broken um, in this particular capacity, but on-site searches on A, right, sir, pretty important today, right? Um, and on-site searches tell a lot about what are people actually looking for? What do we need to create more of? So we have 12 
um, on-site searches on agriculture.com before, uh, 30 days before launch. 30 days after launch, we had 14,000. Um, so 15 very simple things like that. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> it was bad. Literally 12. <laughs> Literally, I have, I have uh, But it makes more kitchens look great, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, we also talked talk about the model that we need folks on the site and even engaged, and if we sell by time or if we're really focused on those engagement metrics and, and being able to market lots of different things to them, um, we need to make sure that they're actually reading the content on the site. So today we have about an 88% on page flow rate, which is interesting because it goes directly into the content that's on the site. This is you again. Okay. So, um, you know. Kind of a little bit of a post-mortem. It's like, what would we do differently? So uh, we we use Aquifer, um, and, which is you know, an in-house tool, but like uh, with any kind of like build process and honestly any kind of development effort, uh, you know, the first uh, couple sprints are you know can be a bit fluid. You know, there's like changing, getting things kind of you know up and running. Uh, and what happens is that uh, you know we would onboard a developer and then it's like, okay, by the way, this aspect of the build has actually changed kind of significantly in now. So you learned this one way and you debugged it, and now we've got this other you know, process we've got to do. So um, you know, kind of a takeaway is just like, uh, let's, let's lock that down before we scale up the development process. Uh, also, uh, you know, try to use a single continuous integration or deployment solution. So uh, you know, there was, uh, you know, we started using Circle CI like upfront, and then uh, IT said, it was like, that's, that's fine. Uh, you have to use Jenkins over here. Um, it'd be better if uh, you know, we set up front either like using uh, Jenkins to do everything or use Circle CI to actually create the artifact itself and have another repository that uh, Jenkins could then just deploy from that repository rather than uh, setting up the build process in two separate places. So uh, that's a, you know, kind of a hindsight 2020. Uh, installing Drupal VM with Composer, uh, you know, just recommended. It wasn't a path that was available at the time, now it is. Uh, I experimented with using Git sub modules to do it. Don't, uh, just don't. And, and honestly, if you ever find yourself saying, I should use Git sub modules, don't. Um, bare metal test uh, Drupal VM when updating. So Drupal VM, fantastic. Every once in a while, they're just gonna make a change. It'll be buried in the readme somewhere. And you're like, oh, that sounds great. I'll just pull that in. Oh, shoot, everything just broke. Terribly, um, you know, and uh, and it'll be documented somewhere. Uh, you know, full credit to them, but you know, actually go through the entire setup process and just make sure that everything works before uh, adding it, uh, adding a new version to uh, your repository and having the developers use it. And also, uh, speaking of new developer onboarding, uh, bare metal test the documentation uh, prior to uh, new developer onboarding. Um, and midway through the project, we brought on someone to work on the front end. And uh, across, you know, getting someone on board in the process, you know, used to take an hour. It took him a week, and some of that was because, uh, you know, Drupal VM uh, differences. Uh, some of it was uh, the documentation uh, had stagnated while the project had continued to evolve. It was not uh, kept in place. Some of it was because the developer was not particularly self-starting, you know, and uh, so kind of floundered about. So it was not an efficient use of resources, not an efficient use of time. Um, that developer what did not continue with the project forever. Um, but uh, you know, also some of that lessons learned is as we're trying to do a post mortem, like how did this disaster happen? Oh, you know, the you know we didn't do full testing, right? You know, prior to him coming on and making sure that everything was taken care of, uh, and that you know uh, you want to enable any new team member to be successful, and the best way to do that is uh, consistent and strong documentation. Uh, also, um, you know, retroactively uh, applying fixes based on deployment of subsequent sites, basically making sure that uh, you know, lessons learned and like something that may have been uh, interpreted as a fix to one site actually really should be a fix to both sites or all the sites that are uh, enabled. So you need to make sure that there is that kind of feedback mechanism, especially if you're working with multiple teams or maintaining the, you know, the different sites. Uh, make sure that there's a clear understanding. It's like, hey, by the way, this really should be a common feature or common, common change that is made. And finally, uh, you know, say no. Uh, you can, uh, this is this actually applies to any project. It has absolutely. Uh, <laughs> it's happened on every single project that I've ever worked on. Uh, you know, when you have a fe you know feature request, it's like, can we get this? Can we get that? No, they, you know, it's like uh, try to build a minimally viable product. Try to build something that you know you can actually be tested and iterated on, rather than trying to build the world and then see if people want to use the world, and maybe they just wanted this one simple thing. 
So, practically speaking. Uh, I, I think that uh, on, the, on the client side, you also need to be able to say no, and I'm really good at saying no, I'm really terrible at accepting no. Um, so, just making sure that you know, we talked maybe about this challenge initially, that there is a client side champion. It's looking at this thing holistically. Um, you know, as we've, we've mastered two sites, and I think things have improved, um, but as we add three, four, five, it's going to become really, really important um, and to maintain everything and making sure that the efficiencies are realized across the board requires this person. Um, so, someone who owns it, someone who has the authority to, to say yes, no, um, to be able to hear no and say, all right, then what's, what's the compromise? Um, you need this, you need this, we have budget for neither of those, so there's something we can do in the middle that um, it's going to kind of help everyone across the board. Okay. So, uh, Drupal builds are what I consider the way of the future. I mean, it's absolutely fantastic for large projects, enterprise projects. I mean, we've uh, done a lot of publishing work, um, you know, things like Entertainment Weekly and People Magazine you know, that I worked on that had build processes where you, you know, took the same, uh, you know, some of the same ideologies and, uh, and you know, adapted it to this particular use case. Um, you know, with, with that said, it isn't for everyone. It can be definitely overkill for a smaller project. I mean, especially if you're just spinning up a brochure site that's kind of like a one-off thing or, uh, you know, individual project. This doesn't mean for all of your existing work, it's like try this new complicated you know, way of doing it. It's just like, you know, use your best judgment. You know, every site is different. Uh, you know, uh, there's a bunch of use cases that I think are absolutely fantastic for distributions, especially if you're uh, creating a number of sites with complex functionality that are very, very similar or identical to each other. You know, use this instead of a multi-site. Um, you know, so use your best judgment. Um, I consider hybrid distributions to be optimal because uh, you, you can consolidate the custom work you know, into one place. You have the separation of the contributed code, you know, the open source code from the community. Uh, extremists in any, any context are, you know, can be unpleasant. So, I mean, having everything in one place is a pain in the butt. Uh, having everything completely separated is a pain. Uh, you know, the same like with people that you work with, there's just no social. It's like someone who's like screaming at you, uh, you know, about like one really extreme position. Probably don't want to spend a lot of time with it. You know, find something that works somewhere in the middle. Uh, automating quality checks is incredibly important, and you can also apply this to smaller, uh, you know, smaller projects. For example, syntax errors. Uh, your code base should not contain any syntax errors. You know, fatal, you know, fatal uh, error that will take down your site if that particular script is executed. Uh, apply coding standards. It makes it easier to work with, uh, you know, uh, especially if you're collaborating with a team. But even if it's just yourself working on it, you know, just you know, do the right thing. Don't don't make a mess where you sleep. Uh, you know, uh, use behavioral testing, and I'm, uh, there are actually some questions coming up about uh, behavioral testing and like how we use that. But uh, behavioral testing, you know, just making sure that you walk through, you know, certain kinds of steps, the key workflows. I mean, if your site, if you have a workflow that is like, uh, as a non-logged user, I go to the front page, I click login, I go here, I update my profile. This is what I expect every user to be able to do. You know, write a test around that so you can guarantee no matter what, that's going to work, and if something breaks it, then you need to figure out why and to take care of it. And it's that canary in the coal mine that actually, you know, if, it, if little speedy is not flapping around anymore, you should do something about it. Uh, it also prevents regression. So, uh, you know, as as you add onto a site, you know, the first you know first test may seem like completely simple. You know, as a user, I can see the name of the site on the front page. You know. That. You know, it's like, why would you write a test like that? Because if someone you know, like makes a change to the theme, you know, that break, you know, that removes you know the site name, you know, you want to know that. Um, don't reinvent the wheel. So uh, <laughs> we this is an open source community. There's a lot of open source uh, software that is available. You know, investigate and leverage open source solutions first. Like try to find something off the shelf. Don't just try to like build itself. Don't play the not invented here. Try to see if there's a community supported solution first. Uh, you know, if there is you know something that gets you ninety percent of the way and you know, has it, and you have something that will get it like to one hundred percent, you know, can shoot me back fixes and improvements that will actually get it there. You know, this is about being a good you know citizen and also just contributing back to the community. Uh, you know, and just in general, avoid one-off solutions about it, if at all practical. You know, especially if you have the context of like I'm developing for two sites simultaneously, I need to make something that is agnostic that isn't hard-coded to a particular situation that can accept 
uh, you know, some kind of uh, configuration that will allow me to make a decision in that context. Um, you know, if it's practical. I mean, this is this isn't like the you know utopian. Every piece of code should be perfectly atomic, and we'll just use it. We're we're practically we have to deliver sites on a timeline. We need to deliver value. You know, it's like we can't always do what sounded good in a computer science classroom in a blog post somewhere. Uh, you know, do what works. But you know, if you can, try to avoid a one-off solution. Uh, reusability. You know, across the board, and you know, is is awesome. You know, it's like find something that kind of works. We, we Courtney was mentioning, like finding something that works between the two brands. It's like, well, this gets you ninety percent of the way through your visit there. Yes, cool. Let's focus and move on, or like deal with this exception on a case by case basis. Uh, open source software is absolutely fantastic. Drupal is open source uh, abstraction. Uh, and creating those solutions that are reusable makes it really easy. Uh, makes it uh, you know, promotes collaboration not only within the you know within the community you know such as this, but also within organizations. You know, uh, where you can say it's like, hey, this is the way that we've done it. You know, like you know, uh, my collaborations with uh, Joshua on like you know things like login or like saying like this is how you've done it. This is how we've done this. Like, let's try to find something that works for both of us. So we're not reinventing the wheel. Uh, you know, and finally, like, get permission first. Just because you worked on something that you know, involves open source software doesn't mean that you have permission to publish it as open source software, uh, especially if you're doing client work. But you can just make sure that someone has signed off on it and said, it's like, yes, it's okay for me to contribute back this code you know, to the community. Usually, it's okay. Uh, vast majority of the time, it's been okay. It's not, you know, not, a, not a problem. You need to make sure that someone has okayed that. So if someone you know, down the road says, why is our name on this you know, Drupal.org and it owed the permission for that, it's on an NDA or something, then you know, that becomes a problem. So, any questions? I know there are questions. Watch this. <laughs> Boom! What kinds of things can you test with VHAT? For example, attaching file images to nodes do not seem to be supported. Uh, how do you decide what is tested and to what extent? So, um, Actually, attaching files and images to nodes is supported, uh, but the way that you do it is uh, form interactions. Uh, so we actually tested that along with uh, you know, solar interactions, and some of this just required custom development. Um, yeah, there's, uh, uh, I'm blanking on the name of it. Uh, it's, uh, there, there's a number of examples. If you go look at the Drupal extension, it will tell you how to write custom tests. Uh, there's a fair, a fair amount of documentation. That's honestly like how we did it was, uh, basically, um, you know, looking for examples. So um, you know, it's like, so it, uh, it is possible you might have to write some custom code. Uh, like, for example, with uh, solar searches, uh, we, we actually tested solar searches in the way that really had to do that was, uh, you know, some custom steps, which included, like, uh, do, you know, forcing a solar re-index as, as part of one of the steps. And so, we, you know, automated that and yeah, so how do you decide what is tested? Um, you know, so it's, again, it's getting back to like identifying what the key workflows are. It's like, what do you expect the user to do? Or if you're creating a new site feature, it's like, um, you know, for example, there, there's a tip of the day. So you kind of set up a scenario. It's like, uh, I expect that, um, you know, I have created a, uh, you know, two tips, uh, each one of them with a separate date. One of the dates is today, one of the dates is yesterday. Uh, and uh, my expectation is that the tip from today is the one that is shown. And so I'm looking for this particular piece of content. Um, and to what extent, um, you know, in a perfect world, you, you have test-driven development in which you write a test before you actually write the feature, and then you write the feature to pass the test. Uh, that's a perfect world. That's not always practical. In fact, uh, it's almost never practical. Uh, instead, you try to like figure out, like, what are the things that I really can't live without? Um, you know, actually, bug reports are a wonderful way to write tests. You write, you know, uh, I mentioned that kind of like tip of the day, you know, scenario. It's like, okay, so I I have that test. Uh, you know, it turns out that that feature actually uh, wasn't looking at the date; it was only showing me the most uh, recent published. And now there's a bug report about that. So I'm going to write a test, uh, write a test to address that bug report, in which it says, okay, uh, if I um, create two tips of the day, one is uh, scheduled to publish on today, but is written first, and then this other one was scheduled to publish yesterday and written second, you know, which one, uh, I expect to see the one that is scheduled, and then that, so you modify the test, 
and you continue to evolve it. So it's, uh, you know, there is no rule of thumb, but it's kind of like if you create a feature, write something that tests that feature in some way. So uh, another question, uh, you know, was or is there a dedicated QA team or person in addition to the functionality testing? Uh, no, there was not, uh, not on this project. Some projects have them, some have, now this one did not. Uh, in our particular context, uh, the individual developers, um, you know, we made it especially early on in the project development uh, as part of our definition of done for a particular, you know, site feature. You know, the developer, if you add a feature or if you, you know, make a modification or a bug fix, you need to write a test around that. Um, you know, uh, the, the I would also add that maybe the clients did a lot of QA to it. Well, so. <laughs> yeah, uh, the, um, in the context of online yeah. testing, because yeah. I, I did not notify you every single code <laughs> change. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but then, but actually, like uh, you know, getting into uh, you know having user acceptance testing, uh, if there's a, if there's something that you're doing that is repetitive, that is uh, uh, done on a regular basis, and actually getting into a bigger <clears> question of like product owners. Uh, the scripting language that is used for BHAT testing is actually natural language. So when I when I talk through that kind of scenario, it's like as a I, as an anonymous user, I go to this page and click this. That is actually something that uh, you know can be empowered uh, uh, that a product owner could actually write in relatively natural language and not take very much translation for a developer to actually implement. Um, you know, it's like. Uh, you know, at, if you are looking to advocate for use of it with an organization or a project, to say, "Hey, we have a testing mechanism that does this." You know, you know, can you uh, you have can you describe how this feature is supposed to work? And part, and you can basically take that user story and convert it into an actual test. Like you said, we, we're we're piloting having our GAs write their functional requirements in pure user terms, so they don't get a they can't drill down to the specifics of certain things because they just don't know it, but they can give us a global aspect of a generic test to start from, and then we can just add enough to the book. I don't know. Um, I need to talk to our VA about some specific, um, like how he flows from one to the other. When I read it, I'm confused. And that shouldn't be the case. You should be able to just read through this as anyone and be able to say, I know exactly what's happening. So we're kind of like just going with the flow. We want to make sure that it's not adding uh, the cost to the project as far as time or just money or things like that. So full time it's going to be kind of what we say. And there's a, there, there is a cost benefit analysis. It takes time to implement the test, it takes time to run the test. Conversely, how much time are you spent fixing bugs or tracking down bugs or like dealing with a problem down the road where? Uh, like a regression of like, okay, this used to work and now suddenly it doesn't. You know, you know, so that's time wasted, you know, so which would you prefer? Like to take preventative measures that will detect if there's a problem that will surface it to the developer early in the process so they can address it, or wait for deployment and then wait for someone to complain. So uh, that's that's how we usually do that. Uh, when we're referring to Drupal VM, this is, yeah, this is the one that is made by uh, Jeff Geerling, uh, our Geerling guy. Uh, when I post the slides, there will be a link to it. Uh, the, the website is also just drupalvm.org. Uh, no space, no dash, just drupalvm.org. What is the on-page scroll rate and how do you measure it and what, uh, what is site provide? Uh, these are answers, questions for you, I think. Excellent, thank you, whoever asked that. I really agree with it. Uh, <laughs> no, we, have a, we work with a vendor called Oats um, and another group called Parsec, and they, they measure all of that. So. Um, Karma, as I talked about before, has all this stuff kind of wrapped into it on the ad side, and so we track a lot of things through that. Um, viewability just means, is, is the ad seen, the specific ad um, creative? Is it, is it in an active window at least 50% for one full second? That's how you measure that. Again, ad needs to be seen before we can kind of track any other engagement or metrics with it. Um, On-page scroll rate also through modes um, tracks multiple ways. I can't get into the science of how that's actually done, but if, um, I'm not sure who submitted that, but if you want to, I'd be glad to connect you with the folks at Mode. Um, so uh, talking about DNS prefetching, uh, so you know, specifically uh, on mobile, it's like how is it important, how did we do it with Drupal? So DNS prefetching is, uh, you know, 
Um, I'm, I'm actually not a front end expert. I have front end expertise, but not specifically in the area. Uh, please correct me if I'm wrong as I go along with this, but my understanding of it is, is uh, uh, setting up, uh, basically is telling the browsers like, hey, by the way, you know, within the building of this page, I'm gonna be getting assets from these resources. Uh, do a super early request to that domain so I, act, so I can actually know, uh, you, know, the, you know, the IP of, of the actual asset that I'm going to you know, do that lookup. And so when, it, when you actually comes to the time of doing that request, uh, that request can be completed. The, the lookup has already been done, and so the idea is that the browser is doing this kind of asynchronously as it's going along, and so uh, as uh, instead of having kind of like a waterfall, you where you wait for one thing and then one thing after another. Because as you, uh, yeah. So uh, how was it implemented? Uh, you know, specifically we used uh, AdVag, uh, Advanced Aggregator. Uh, it's an open source project on Drupal.org/slash ADVAGG. Uh, and uh, that actually, uh, you know, based on uh, based on the assets that are being requested, it actually puts those DNS prefetch entries uh, in uh, at the uh, at the top of the head as early as possible within the actual page request. Why is it important on Drupal? Well, in, uh, on especially mobile, is right because uh, mobile connections typically are slower, and it takes uh, you know usually uh, compared to a desktop connection, you know, there's a uh, additional step that need to be uh, additional hops between you and whatever the origin is via the you know, the, uh, the request to the DNS server and then also you know the acquisition of the assets. So uh, you know mobile will be more sensitive to having those additional hops. So whoop, uh, that's actually how many more sites are in the pipeline? Uh, that's whoop, new top questions. Um, sorry, one second. This is, this is the first time I've ever used this. Give me a sec. Okay. What types? Of, how many more sites are in the print, you know, pipeline? Uh, two or three, to the best of my knowledge. that question uh, and finally uh, are you ever going to give me up or let me down I promise not to desert you so on that note uh, thank you